So uh, we are going to shift gears now and focus kind of building on some of that to talk about a clinical practice showcase. Um, and we are going to welcome some colleagues from London Health Sciences Centre. So we have Caitlin Fisher, Lauren Columbus and Megan Furnival joining us today. I'm going to do uh, some brief bios for each of them and then I will let them launch into their conversation. So Caitlin Fisher is a registered midwife with the Midwives of Middlesex and Area and is the Chief of the Department of Midwifery at London Health Sciences. Sciences. Her current research involves exploring interprofessional work and collaboration between midwives and pediatricians. Lauren Columbus is a registered midwife with the same practice, Midwives of Middlesex and Area, and is the academic practice lead in the Department of Midwifery. She is a current graduate student at the School of Health Profession Education at Maastricht University, and her research interests include interprofessional communication and team dynamics, best practice in fetal health surveillance and simulation. And finally, we have Megan Furnival, who's also a registered midwife with the Talbot Creek Midwives and the Department Research Lead at London Health Sciences. Her research interests include skin-to-skin -skin contact in cesarean section, shared decision-making, postpartum mental illness, and midwifery burnout. So welcome, Caitlin, Lauren, and Megan. Uh, we see your slides. They are looking great. And we look forward to uh, hearing from you. And then we'll have some time for discussion after as well. Thank you. I just want to check to make sure that you are hearing me. I was having some technical difficulties. Perfect. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for this wonderful invitation to share with you the framework uh, that the midwifery leadership team at uh, London Health Science Center developed to support our department members' uh, movement to uh, full scope with oxytocin. Um, uh, a skill set. Uh, um, as we said, uh, thank you so much for the lovely introduction. And so I just want to give a little bit of uh, background and context to where this um, kind of came about. So Meg, you can advance it twice if need be. Perfect. We already went through the app. Great. Um, so in 2019, the Department of uh, midwifery here in London, Ontario at uh, Tertiary Centre, the London Health Science Centre, underwent a review process uh, and this occurs every five years at the end of uh, a chief uh, term in the department. Uh, the review was quite extensive and made several recommendations including supporting an academic midwifery department um, with equitable compensation for midwifery leadership as well as supporting our it, entire department and members to work into full scope including uh, oxytocin and epidemic and in 2020, um, the Department of Midwifery received a grant from the Children's Health Foundation to support a full-time chief and two lead positions, an academic lead position and a research lead position, uh, to help build the foundation for an academic midwifery department, which was in line with the strategic goals and vision of our tertiary centre in London, Ontario. Um, our VP of Clinical Programs uh, really explained some of the challenges um, with the department working to different levels of scope. Um, predominantly of the five midwifery practices that had privileges at LHSC, uh, one of the midwifery practices did not hold uh, oxytocin privileges. And although all of the midwives at LHSC maintained um, most responsible person status for our clients receiving an epidural, uh, the epidural was monitored by nursing and required uh, nursing resources in order to facilitate an epidural for our clients. And so our first task of the midwifery leadership team when we came into our roles was to support this work for entire department and all of the midwifery practices um, to be working with uh, oxytocin and epidural. Um, and so uh, I, Lauren uh, will be speaking to you as well as Meg uh, about uh, the work that we did to create this framework and this educational rollout uh, in order to support these educational needs. Um, some of the challenges and barriers that we did experience um, prior to this was uh, to engage our department members and to, to get their buy-in. Um, most of our uh, adopters were quite uh, excited to participate. As we know, the research speaks to uh, full scope midwifery having uh, greater um, evidence uh, for uh, higher satisfaction and uh, less interventions. Um, and as well as just to advocate for an appropriate timeline to actually achieve this educational rollout. Um, as you know, it, it's not so easy to just snap your fingers the next day and, uh, and uh, obtain these skill sets. So I'll pass it on to my colleagues. Lauren uh, to review the design and implementation of this initiative. Thanks so much, Katie. 
Uh, so I'm going to outline the process we used for designing, implementing, and evaluating our training programs. And though this is specific to oxytocin and epidurals, really this framework uh, that we are suggesting can be applied to any competency that you're trying to develop that is relevant to midwifery today. So maybe it's, you know, getting everyone skilled in IUD insertion or point of care ultrasound, um, amnio infusion and IUPC monitoring, whatever, whatever it may be. Um, we wanted the framework to be sort of broadly applicable uh, to any major competency that's seen uh, as a local need uh, for your institution. So just keep that in mind. Um, and though I do know and recognize that there are so many hospitals and midwifery practices that are not working uh, to full scope involving oxytocin and epidural at their centers. So um, in that case, this will still be quite, quite relevant for you. Uh, next slide. Perfect. So when it came time to actually designing, um, and just before I get started, we have about approximately 50 uh, privileged midwives in our department. So we were looking at a, a decent number of bodies to get through this training program. So some of that factored in as well. Um, we really focused on the knowledge, skills, and attitudes that we thought would be necessary to develop um, for the, the competence, both of oxytocin management and epidural. Um, and then we developed sort of authentic learning activities that slowly increased in complexity um, as we decreased support. So as you can see here, we got started with the basics in terms of self-directed learning packages and an exam, which is fairly common. Um, and we just wanted to cover the basics for physiology and pharmacology in a way that saved, you know, in-person time. Um, we then moved up to focusing on simulation sessions. So we have a really lovely um, high fidelity simulation center at LHSC uh, that we have full access to. And so we ran um, all, par all participants, all 50 uh, midwives through oxytocin and epidural simulations that focused mostly on emergencies um, and sort of rare complications, just knowing that those are, uh, sim is a really safe place to practice those skills. So we, um, for many midwives, this was their first experience with simulation, uh, let alone high fidelity simulation. Um, and so that was sort of a side product that uh, was a little bit of a benefit of doing this is that now um, we have people who are a little bit more confident um, with sim and participating in simulation going forward. Uh, so next we had uh, midwives and we advocated to have our nurses provide training for our midwives at births where they the, the midwives would have previously been transferring uh, care anyway, but instead that they would remain and have the nurses provide um, training at their own clients' births for these midwives. So they weren't asked to attend additional births, but rather the nurses um, agreed to provide sort of their technical skills training. And we did ask as well that the obstetricians, you know, if they were able, could provide as well their own um, sort of like time to discuss and review their management, um, though that wasn't set as a base expectation in this case. We created skills checklists that we made sure they got through. And then once they'd done uh, preferably a few with the nurses, we then had uh, midwifery trainers who were hired um, and compensated to then attend the same um, midwives' births of their own clients again. Um, so the in that case, the midwife was remaining MRP, um, but just would have a separate midwifery trainer skilled in oxytocin use in the room to sort of help provide that training right in the room. Um, and then lastly, they would be independently performing this uh, on their own, um, but they still had the ability to call trainers um, for phone support if needed. And I believe we kept that up for about six months. All right, next slide. In terms of the implementation, this is just sort of a simple outline of, of our implementation steps. And we started with funding. And for anyone who was present at, you know, earlier this week at the um, MMRC session on midwifery burnout, uh, I think ensuring adequate compensation and so to, to know that we weren't taking this work on pro bono was really important to us. And that went both for, um, you know, those of us who were involved in all of the training, um, which was namely uh, Katie and myself, uh, as well as the trainers, though, that we were asking to attend these midwifery births. So we were able to secure compensation for those pieces. Um, we also engaged all the stakeholders that we possibly could have involved in this. And that's a lesson that we've learned. Um, you know, if you think you have all your stakeholders, you probably still don't. Um, so we had lots of OBCU stakeholders and we knew we would need nursing on board to provide that education, um, which, you know, frankly, they some of the comments were that they were a little bit nervous actually to be involved in teaching midwives where they felt, um, you know, that there was a little bit of a different dynamic there. So we had to do some work with their leadership to really sort of encourage that um, and that we valued their skills um, in these areas that they'd been managing for a long time. 
We also needed our OB colleagues on board uh, to be kept abreast because it would help them know when they were to stop expecting consults for, for IOLs and for oxytocin use versus not. Um, and also we just really needed to ask for patients with them while this new skill was um, adopted so that we could have sort of a psychologically safe environment for people learning a new skill. Um, so we attended various, you know, citywide meetings and charge nurse meetings to try to make this run smoothly. We also tried to start early communication with our learners um, so that we really, this wasn't a surprise. We gave people a lot of heads up. We gave wide timelines. Um, and so uh, really kind of communicating clearly with those that are going to be involved in learning. In terms of timelines, um, we were asked to have a fairly tight timeline on this and had to advocate, um, as Katie mentioned, for that timeline to be a little bit wider, just knowing the variety in work schedules for midwives and just that sometimes you can go months realistically without any oxytocin use at all. So we, um, you know, had had advocated for a bit of a, an open period and Meg's going to talk about that a little bit more in a moment. We also opted to roll out our training in phases so that, uh, you know, as people completed their didactic learning and then moved on to completing all of the simulations and then could start getting their feet wet, um, you know, in real uh, settings with, with clients. And lastly, uh, addressing complaints and concerns immediately. As you know, with any sort of change curve, there's going to be lots of complaints, lots of concerns, lots of feedback. And so uh, Katie and I made sure we were around so that any of the sort of chitter chatter that happens at nursing stations or complaining or, um, you know, even amongst midwives that we were able to address it, you know, immediately, um, as well as in one-on-one -on -one sort of fashion so that uh, we weren't... Um, we weren't letting things snowball or letting sort of a negative attitudes kind of spiral out of control and have that become the, the actual narrative. All right, next slide. And so in terms of evaluation, um, we decided that uh, we really felt most interventions, you know, often in educational inter innovations and interventions, the, the uh, evaluation portion is forgotten. Um, but we knew that we'd have more education interventions ahead of us and that taking some, you know, good stock of the evaluation uh, for this one would help us with any future educational endeavors. And so we started um, a few methods for evaluating the success of this program. The first was uh, establishing a quality assurance and quality improvement committee for our department. So we created our own trigger tools, audit tools, um, and and, uh, and a committee that would get together and review triggered charts, um, as well as some randomly audited charts, just uh, knowing that oxytocin ultimately is involved in, in a lot of um, sort of challenging outcomes. And so this felt like a good way to be able to review oxytocin use uh, for our, our unit and then provide a lessons learned back to our midwifery uh, members. We also uh, had really strong outcome data monitoring. So uh, Katie has become pretty proficient in her born use and um, her sort of reviewing and collection of all of our TOC rates, um, our IOL rates and our outcomes for all of those rates. We keep pretty tight tabs on our vaginal birth rate, um, you know, our, our cesarean section rate. Um, and she, we've also performed many manual chart audits as well, just to see where the actual issues are in cases, for example, of transfers of care that ultimately resulted in vag spontaneous vaginal births. You know, what was happening there? Why was that happening? Um, and so that has been a really big part in informing us sort of how we're doing with our education. And lastly, the feedback and, and program evaluation piece from our own members, as well as from uh, some of the charge nurses and nurses, um, we're collecting qualitative and quantitative data via anonymous surveys. And that has mostly been Meg's work, which she will talk about um, in a moment in her section. Next slide. And so in terms of the actual framework, um, this is derived from a quality assurance framework from a researcher um, out of the Netherlands, Deanna Dolmans, um, as well as Renee Stallmeyer, who are two experts in quality assurance and essentially sort of developing quality cultures within, um, within the health professions. So we have taken her framework and added an educational component. And I think it's easy when you're launching an educational initiative to really just focus on those sort of educational components of your training program. But I would argue that your managerial and structural as well as your personal and uh, psychological factors are almost more important in the success of a training initiative. 
So we view the educational and managerial um, aspects as, as those pieces that we are responsible for as leaders. And then the personal psychological components are the aspects that your learners are really going to take on. So of course, you know, uh, as the leaders, we felt like, okay, if we do our, our part and take on the, the creation of the educational components listed here, as well as um, some of the more managerial points, then we'll have to figure out ways to have our, our learners take on the, the psychological pieces. So I'll just kind of quickly point a few out the educational piece I've, I've outlined already above, which was, you know, our steps that we took to actually train. Um, and then the only other point was to the creation of just in time resources that we uh, made for all of the members to have so that if these were skills that they were using infrequently, they had something to refer to on hand. As far as uh, the managerial uh, and structural components, you know, the biggest thing for us was maintaining autonomy. And this meant that we were the ones that created the program and that no one was overseeing this other than us. Um, you know, we didn't want nursing involvement in terms of overseeing and monitoring, and we certainly didn't want obstetrical involvement for overseeing and monitoring. And, um, and that was uh, bar none the most important thing that we advocated for from the beginning. We included the stakeholders in our launch plan um, and made sure we secured finances and we are, um, had our ongoing evaluation in QA. In terms of the personal and psychological piece, um, this is uh, definitely a harder one uh, to address in terms of how do you develop these within your culture. And so there's a lot of, uh, you know, great research and work out there around developing a quality culture and how you can sort of make these aspects, um, I guess, innate within, within your department members and your culture, but it, they're, they're not things that happen overnight. Um, we think that there's, you know, lots of uh, time and focus that has to go into building some of these pieces. So, um, you know, really focusing on a growth mindset in your department, uh, developing communities of practice that you can do through special interest groups within your department, and really going back to that commitment to client-centered care. So the more that you can make this about your clients uh, and their care and their safety, I think the, the easier that this is for people to take on. And ultimately, you know, an overall goal to reduce the transfer of care rate, which keeps more people in midwifery care um, with those great outcomes that we know they can have. All right, um, with that, I'm going to pass it on to Meg to take on feedback and evaluation. So we surveyed the midwives and the oxytocin trainers, but we haven't um, actually gotten to surveying the nursing staff yet. So that's coming. There was quite a lot going on during the training process in regards to the pandemic, midwifery burnout, um, the culture at LHSC with all of these initiatives going on. So to have a really smooth delivery of the program was challenging to say the least. Um, now currently the midwives have been on average uh, practicing and implementing oxytocin and epidurals for about seven months. So the training's been completed for seven months and they've been um, providing care in this capacity for that length of time. So when we asked the midwives to rank the top three most useful resources for training, they talked a little bit about uh, the pre-learning packages and the simulations. Uh, they talked about the simulations and the pre-learning packages as being somewhat useful to very useful. Nobody rated them poorly. Um, we know that these training packages probably could be updated because they're used in other departments for training, um, but they were they were reportedly you know useful. Um, they also reported that uh, when you ask them what the top three best resources were. 73% of the midwives uh, did say their colleagues were their best resources. Um, and just so you know, we had about a just over 50% response rate from the department regarding the training. And then charge nurses were um, uh, the second highest reported resource, which I think is really useful from uh, our perspective. And um, the midwifery and nurse trainers were at 36%, which is interesting given that the midwifery trainers were probably the largest economic investment, um, but um, they, they weren't rated as the most used. And that kind of comes out a little bit later in the trainer feedback. So some of the comments that were made in the surveys included 
I really love the simulation training in the lab. I wish we would have had more sim. That that came back a lot. Um, a lot of the feedback was, I really liked the training, but I wished we had more. And others said, I felt the sim training was not quite enough hands-on training. Uh, I love the training by other midwives that really helped me consolidate my learning and practice. Um, some midwives who were trained by midwives in other practices or worked together throughout the training really um, touted that as a really beneficial experience to see other midwives from other practices in a clinical context, which was which was really great for um, building interprofessional or interpractice relationships. Other feedback, uh, which was probably one of the most prominent findings um, a midwife had written, I didn't realize how important it was for me to be really competent in fetal health surveillance. I found running oxytocin made me more nervous because I didn't feel comfortable with abnormal tracings. So this was a... Um, a pretty common comment, um, midwives reporting that they really felt like they it was apparent they needed to brush up on their fetal health surveillance skills. It was challenging at times to know when to push the oxytocin. Having a midwife on the floor to ask was very helpful. So it was almost like oxytocin was driving the car and the fetal health surveillance was telling them where to go. And it felt like many of them had said, you know, I, I really... I think it's all good when it's all good, but when things start to get murky and a little bit complicated, it became more and more apparent that oxytocin makes me nervous because I'm not that solid in my fetal health surveillance. So that was an, a very important finding for us. And when they talked about how much training is enough training, others said, I would have loved more case studies or opportunities to role play when to turn it on and off. So this is a common finding, technical skills, how do I run the pump? What happens in an emergency? Um, others said that they had, um, they went up to the floor a few times and they did try to get as much volume as they could quickly. And the back to back bursts and pump management was really helpful for them. Others said um, uh, oxytocin, um, it was easier to learn epidurals than it was oxytocin management, which, which makes sense when you think about it. Um, oxytocin was the bigger learning curve. And I'm very happy to be able to use oxytocin within my practice now and provide full scope to our clients. So we did find that the early adopters and the training really kind of hit the ground running, which is pretty standard in a, in a change curve. Um, and then the midwives who were um, not as um, interested in learning the skill or really felt like it was a lot to take on in the pandemic, um, they, they uh, originally didn't appreciate it, but then the feedback after when we surveyed them was that actually I really I kind of do like having this skill and this in my toolkit. So what were the effects of the increased scope of practice on our workplace culture? So what we did was we just, we looked at relationships and, and everyone's sort of self-reported changes in their relationships with nursing staff and obstetrics. So um, at this point, 70% of midwives report that they appreciate running oxytocin, which is um, up from when we asked them before. Uh, and then they, they talked about how the relationships with nursing improved for many midwives um, and the relationships with uh, obstetrics improved for um, a number of midwives, sort of between 30 and 40 percent, but um, the majority uh, really reported that the relationships hadn't changed. The midwifery trainers, um, I'm not going to go into too much detail because I know Lauren kind of has already talked about this, but um, midwifery trainers really felt like it was really important for them to make sure that it was a psychologically safe environment when they came into someone else's labor and someone else's birth. It was important that they didn't um, imply in any way that the midwife in training was not capable of managing a birth because she was learning how to run the pump. Um, so being collegial and professional was highly important. Um, trainers talked about how they felt underutilized. They were being paid for their time and their availability, but they felt like midwives were talking about how big the learning curve was, but yet they weren't really being called upon for advice or consults. Um, and they found it difficult because they were trying to be available, but then they had their own call um, teams to take care of and manage um, and, and stress while sleeping off births, wondering if they were going to get called. Other barriers to training uh, really from the trainer's perspective included um, midwives just, just not wanting to adopt this skill, uh, feeling like um, they weren't interested in doing it. So it was, it was um, the growth mindset really kind of assisted midwives 
in hitting the ground running, learning the skill, and then reporting more confidence and better outcomes. The other one is fetal health surveillance. It was apparent to some of the trainers that, you know, when they were in the room assisting with the training, it was hard um, for them to push the pump when the understanding of the trace was sort of lagging. And then the trainers reported that in the future, it would be nice if they got together in advance and kind of um, streamlined their approach to training um, so that it, they were all kind of doing something very similar. So the things that we kind of took home from this was that, I mean, in the pandemic, oxytocin and epidural training uh, is a lot to take on. And that was very apparent. Um, LHSC had given us a very kind of strict um, uh, approach to how and when this needed to be done by. But in future, we would, we would advise that you stagger the approach, um, whether you do epidurals first, because they seem to be learned quickly, um, relative to oxytocin, and oxytocin and fetal health surveillance should be paired together so that there is a strong approach to making sure that there's a solid fetal health surveillance foundation before you start to um, play around with stalled labor and oxytocin. Other things that came back was just practice, practice, practice. We love the STEM. We we love the training, we love the case review, we just would have liked more of it. Um, so um, getting that off, offloading some of the prep work and some of the training to midwives within the department would be really helpful um, so that the same two uh, midwives aren't kind of doing all of that volume of training. And um, timeline wise, it was apparent with epidurals that um, the early adopters tended to uh, get that training and that volume very quickly. The large majority of the department did wait until kind of the third or fourth, um, three or four months out from the year end to get to finalize their epidural training. So we weren't really sure if based on the feedback, it wasn't it didn't seem to be so much that it was a clinical competency issue. It was like more of a timeline issue. So we are we are supposing that maybe are proposing that maybe if that timeline were shortened, the epidural competency might be achieved faster. But oxytocin, notably, is a longer uh, a longer thing to learn. So um, we think that the year was long enough to get um, most people certified, but even now, seven months later, midwives are still learning how to run oxytocin in complex cases. So that might take longer than a year um, for midwives to feel really comfortable with it. Um, and then finally, midwife sim trainers, we were just kind of talking about how useful it would be to have midwives um, trained in sim and sim debriefing so that when we roll out initiative, an initiative like this, other midwives in each practice would be able to take on the training within their practices instead of having the same department members training all of the midwives in all of the practices. Uh, roles and responsibilities for midwives and nurses. So the leadership team, Katie and Lauren did a, a really good job of representing um, going back and forth, listening to nursing concerns, um, trying to address midwifery concerns. It was a lot of back and forth, um, but without the collaboration and the clear communication, the initiative would have probably not been very successful. Um, so then um, the other piece, the other take home message was just really encouraging midwives who uh, are transferring care for oxytocin while they're learning um, and they aren't certified yet to do as much as they can to stay for the burst in the transfer of care role so that they can learn the pump, learn the management, ask the questions, watch the documentation to help them build that skill set faster. So when we look at the confidence levels pre and post training, um, before the training, 30% of midwives reported they were not confident at all in, in oxytocin um, management. 50% said they were somewhat confident and 20% said they were very confident. After the training was completed, um, nobody reported that they weren't confident. 18% said that they were somewhat confident and 81% said that they were very confident. And it's reflected in the transfer of care rate. Although the transfer of care rate is not the only thing that we want to be using as a metric to, to gauge the quality of the midwifery care that we're providing, because obviously transfers are relevant and important. Um, but we know that keeping clients in midwifery care when it is safe to do so is, is really, it offers really good outcomes for our clients. So we, uh, we would welcome any questions. 
Thank you so much, Lauren, Katie, and Meg. This has been fantastic. I think there's so much to actually unpack here because um, I think what you've taught us already is some of the key elements for you know implementing a change. And so there's lots I think that midwives might want to engage in terms of the dialogue around that because we're always thinking of new things we want to be doing. And then so so many specific learnings I think around uh, you know this this process and this new skill set for the midwives in your community. So really great information and I appreciate you sharing it with us today. We've had some questions uh, in the chat. I see Lauren has already replied to a few in the Q&A, but if people want to add some details there as well, lots of positive feedback about uh, how helpful this has been. Uh, let me see if I can flag one question. Oh, so somebody did ask about how much nursing support was needed for oxytocin use. I don't know if you want to comment on that. Yeah. Um, so for oxytocin uh, specifically, we said anywhere from sort of three to five to six births uh, in terms of supervision would be something that we could support in terms of both our midwifery trainers and nursing trainers. And so some people who uh, maybe were feeling like they'd done it as students and like it felt a little bit more fresh to them, maybe only needed three and others who it had been quite a, you know, maybe 10 to 15 years since they'd ever run oxytocin, we're looking maybe at the higher end. So um, we, we just asked that if they felt like they needed nursing supervision for that birth, then they just ask for it and go, go along with it. So um, generally speaking, the nurses were really collegial with us in terms, you know, they recognize they work at an academic teaching center. They're used to teaching learners. They were happy to teach us as well. Um, but I would say that uh, there were some instances where their patients might have been tested a little bit, particularly with epidurals. Um, they were to supervise uh, three epidurals sort of start to finish. And they felt like some midwives were hanging on for quite a bit longer where they were still asking for supervision. So there's some dynamics there around like maintaining sort of good supportive professional relationships um, that we had to address. And that was part of some sort of getting right in on some of the griping that was happening early on. And, and nipping that type of behavior in the bud. Yeah. Yeah. And I think your framework certainly kind of gives us that big picture though, of how the, all the ways in which you have to address that confidence building and the, and the change process. So I think it was so well thought out. Kathy has asked a question in the Q and A about given that oxytocin is a high risk drug and there's ongoing real, or is there ongoing real time mentoring formally available to those who are not confident? And I guess I was thinking something similar around new people who come to the community or uh, new graduates who are at the beginning of their career. Can you tell us a little bit about that kind of ongoing mentoring and? Yeah, so we were like many hospitals where there was that process of, you know, you have to be mentored as a, a new, let's say, an NR joining the community by other midwives in your practice. Um, and that was great for all the practices who were already running it. Um, they kind of had their own mentorship through uh, senior midwives in their practice. The challenge about this was just that none of the midwives at this one particular practice had ever run it before. So um, in terms of what we sort of were able to offer to them ongoing, we did say that if at the end of, you know, three to six births that were being supervised, they still didn't feel comfortable. We certainly didn't want them to be running it if they weren't comfortable and that we said we could work out individualized learning plans. We also recognized that within each practice, there were some people who just had better confidence and kind of became an early adopter. And I think they sort of became somewhat of a mentor within their own practice. Um, but it's a real challenge. Like we were able to offer payment to trainers to sort of stay available by phone for a period of time. Um, but recognizing that all those midwives from other practices have full caseloads as well and that they're on call for. And it, it's, it's a really big challenge to find that ongoing mentorship. Great, thank you. And uh, another question, and I think this, I think this came up from someone else as well. That when you're speaking about this, it's um, you know, it's training for midwives to manage epidurals and oxytocin, but it also was part of the process and the timing at which the College of Midwives on, of Ontario was recommending that midwives also order their own oxytocin for appropriate inductions and augmentation. So, I think that was um, a Louise's question. She just wants to clarify that it's that this is also midwifery led. Um, you know, ordering of oxytocin. 
Yep, that's correct. And we weren't really interested in doing it in phases and saying, oh, you know, first you'll do it on order from the OB. We wanted to just go straight to what was sort of the standard uh, with the rest of the practices at the time and apparently, you know, across the province too at that time. Right. So, yeah, and I think that that's important context for folks who may not be from Ontario or from Canada, that um, that was a change from our regulatory body, that a few years ago, this ability to order oxytocin independently was added to our scope of practice. Um, and certainly the, the regular kind of framework for midwives, knowing what their knowledge, skills and attitudes are and when they need to consult appropriately for, you know, uh, different situations requiring oxytocin or abnormal fetal heart rate tracings. Um, that's still part of the bigger picture of how these things are managed. So I think that was second part of Louise's question, and I hope that answered it, that we would still, you know, consult and collaborate as appropriate for abnormal situations. Um, let me just check the chat to see. Uh, I'm curious, maybe while I'm just checking the chat for any other questions, Katie, can you tell us a little bit? Of, I love this idea that you are regularly monitoring born for your data to see like what what your outcomes look like and all those things. Can you tell us any more about what stuff, what indicators you are looking at or maybe from your QA group as well? What are the key triggers and indicators you're reviewing? Yeah, thank you. Um, I have to say it's a bit of a steep learning curve. It's just like a lot of data and then you have to just try to figure out how to, to use that. But we've been looking at uh, the number of our clients uh, that are being induced, whether they're primips, multips, we're breaking down uh, pain relief, AVD rates, so assisted vaginal delivery rates. Um, if you're induced, what's your chance of cesarean section? Um, we're looking at it, even amongst the primips and the multips. Um, yeah, the transfers of care rates that happen with spontaneous vaginal births um, or spontaneous labors versus transfers of care rates that include uh, inductions. Um, we're looking at our breastfeeding rates in the postpartum, our readmission rates, our infection rates. Um, and so we're trying to get a, a really fulsome picture of the care that we're providing at LHSC and really using that as a uh, kind of the, the trigger for areas that we can improve. Um, and so some things you can get from born and some things you can't. And as uh, Lauren alluded to, uh, one of the things that we were seeing is a fairly like um, significant percentage of clients who were uh, having a spontaneous vaginal birth, but were being transferred. And so we had to go through the charts manually in that instance um, to really look at, you know, where exactly is, is that transfer occurring um, and what might be the reasons for that. So. Um, it's been really, I think, helpful uh, amongst us all to kind of really focus on where we need to put the work and energy in uh, to improve those rates. Can I just add to that, Katie? I was going to say one of the really important findings was that when we did the chart audits and talked to the midwives, one of the key areas that midwives, that was, was um, clear that midwives felt maybe like they needed some more support was the management of the second stage. So it was a lot around, you know, when do you start an augment in the second stage? Because obviously that has a different risk profile than a stalled labor at five centimeters. So there was um, a lot of learning and a lot of sort of pearls that we could take from the chart audit to say, okay, we're seeing more transfers in second stage. Why are we seeing that? And then really kind of going through the charts and getting rid of the ones that are you know, appropriate transfers because we legitimately ran out of tools and needed help um, or is it maternal exhaustion or the patient exhaustion from maybe not starting oxytocin earlier when we had a stalled labor and that patient or client really just kind of ran out of steam um, and then needed, uh, you know, an assisted vaginal delivery or something like that. So that was really helpful to see and to, to take back to the midwives to say, what can we do to support you um, in learning some of these skills that, you know, you maybe would benefit from? Great, thank you. Um, there has been some discussion in the chat about, you know, some of the interprofessional dynamics, right, between midwives and nurses and, you know, other provinces where uh, situations like this might be more involvement of nursing um, to be more of a, a kind of paired approach between nursing and midwives, the way that family docs might work with a nurse. Um, so I'm just wondering, Meg, you alluded to the fact that you have more data coming from maybe some of the other healthcare providers. I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about who who else like, we might hear some data from at some point related to this? Did you talk to OBs and nursing and any insights into some of that? 
We haven't we haven't surveyed them yet. We we that's on the it's on the list of people to kind of send that out to you. Um, but yeah, we we really we would have loved to have had a collaborative like start our inductions. We'll take over when active due to the very prevalent ongoing resource issue um, within our unit and many units. We that just wasn't possible for us um, to do that. So we've been working on sustainable oxytocin so that we can, you know, run our own kind of approach to induction um, separate to the general obstetrical list because there's just so much bottlenecking and people aren't able to come in for their inductions because there's not enough resources. So we haven't surveyed them yet but um but it will be coming that's great yeah this is where we certainly see some variation between provinces in those approaches um nursing and we're talking about nursing staff shortages and you know the role of the midwife within all of that in the chat as well so lots to keep unpacking but thank you for sharing your story i'm so impressed with what you've done and the framework that you've developed i think it has lots of um application that we can think about in a midwifery context and the fact that you've done this in the middle of the pandemic is also to be commended so no wonder you also want to talk about midwife burnout That's, uh, i can i can see how they go hand in hand <laughs> So thank you for joining us today and for uh, sharing those insights. We've got a quick poll up uh, where we can get some feedback about this session. Um, so thank you for these insights.